Relations between the five main parties and the DUP and Sinn Féin in particular are as strained as they've been in a long time. On the face of it, there doesn't seem to be a lot of common ground on what to do next to progress the Haas proposals. The Deputy First Minister, Martin McGuinness, has been giving me his unvarnished thoughts on the current state of play. When he came into the studio earlier, I asked him first how useful Tuesday's meeting between the five party leaders had been. Well, I, I thought it was a useful meeting. I thought it was a first opportunity for the five party leaders to sit down and not just reflect on what had happened over the Christmas and New Year period, but to consider whether or not there was a way forward. And that's what I was trying to establish, whether or not we were going to be involved in a serious effort to explore how we can move forward. And I say that against the backdrop of there you know, not being a lot of confidence in where others are coming from. I mean, for example, uh, it, it was said at one stage that we should set up a mechanism to explore uh, 340 elements of what was in the Haas documents. And I made it clear I wasn't interested in dealing with that, that what we needed to see were those parties who had objections to the Haas document lay those objections on the table so we could explore whether or not there was a way forward. Uh, what I'm trying to avoid, and what I think it's important to avoid, is a time-wasting exercise because we've had a previous experience during the cohesion sharing and integration discussions mm -hmm. on these three issues, which went on for almost three years without a resolution. But if it was a useful meeting, if what was said in there was helpful, and that's what you've suggested, why did you then come out to the Great Hall afterwards and accuse unionists of listening to extreme elements within their community? Because the elephant in the room are the extreme elements within the loyalist community. Those people who have been fomenting conflict on the streets, who have been involved in riots on the streets, who have been in Belfast uh, trying to manipulate the situation for their own purposes. And I say that as someone who has stood four square with my colleagues in the assembly against those people who killed two soldiers in Antrim, who killed Ronan Kerr, Stephen Carroll, David Black. Uh, I expect politicians on the unionist side whenever the police are being attacked, as they were in Belfast city centre, with 350 police officers injured, to stand with me in outright, unreserved condemnation of the activities of those who would try, try to uh, drive us back to the past. Well, the difficulty is, of course, you came out and said what you said. That, that then prompted a response from Nigel Dodds the following day in the House of Commons, who hit back by suggesting Republicans continue to wallow in the filth of murder, as he put it. And it's been downhill from there. So people outside looking in wonder if you're ever going to be able to resolve the issue whenever you just keep knocking lumps out of each other. Well, I don't consider what I'm doing as knocking lumps out of anybody. Because well, the unionists were very annoyed at what you said. I mean, well, they say they're there as elected representatives, they have a mandate, and they're not looking over their shoulders. Well, one thing about me is I, I tell it as it is. What I'm saying to you, what I said to the media the other day, I've said to the faces of my unionist colleagues. And how did they the respond executive. whenever you said that to them? What did they say? Well, I'm not going to respond in the context of what they said, but I absolutely know that within the political echelons of unionism, they absolutely agree with my analysis that, for example, in the city of Belfast, the UVF, the PUP and the Orange Order are one and the same thing, and that they have been hostile to this process over the course of recent years. They deny that. You've heard them and deny that time that, and again. I also say that as someone who met some of these people who have been involved in the flag protests on at least three occasions last year. So I think that I, I come at it from a position of knowledge of where I think people are coming from. Now, you see, the reality of the situation is the comments that were made by Nigel referred to a situation in Castle Derg. A situation where everybody can learn lessons from. But there was nobody injured in Castle Derg. There were no stones thrown, no police officers injured, and a huge attempt was made to uh, have a parade there which would pass over peacefully. What I am talking about is that for 18 months, uh, we have seen a situation in the city of Belfast where there has been a deliberate attempt by extreme elements within loyalism to try to drag us back to the past. A lot of unionists and, and loyalists, you, you know they well, saw Castle Derg as, as very provocative. But let me make this last point. 
Let me make this last point. During the course of that 18 months, I never heard one MLA or one MP from the union side point out who was responsible for these attacks. It was left to the former mayor of Belfast, Gavin Robinson. So are you saying there is an absence of leadership within unionism at the moment? Is that what you're accusing Peter Robinson and Mike Nesbitt of? Well, let, let me put it like this. I, I have stood against the activities of so-called Republican dissidents. My house has been attacked. My wife has been verbally abused in the streets. Slogans have been written all around my house. And my life has been threatened from commemorations that these people have held. I will not be put off by that. I will not bow the knee to that. I will continue to oppose those who would try to drag us back to the past, even at the cost of my own life. And are you saying I that unionists expect... don't sufficiently recognise that fact? Is that your point? No, what I'm saying is that we need to see similar leadership okay. from those who have stood back and watched what everybody knows within the media and indeed within their own political parties is a truism. And what is the truism? The truism is that in Belfast, the Orange Order, the UVF and the PUP have played a very negative role over the course of the last 18 and months. And you know that unionists watching this will say two things. One, you cannot say the UVF, the PUP and the Orange Order are one and the same, and they've made that point time and again. And secondly, they will say that unionist leaders in East Belfast and beyond have repeatedly condemned violence when it has taken place from loyalists and have urged those involved in flag protests over the last year and a bit to take part in peaceful, lawful protests. And that's right. They have done that. Well, f for a start, unionist leaders have told me that they regard the UVF, the PUP and the Orange Order in Belfast which unionist leaders? as one of the same thing. And I'm not going to say which unionist leaders. But I have been told by unionist politicians that the UVF, the PUP and the Orange Order are effectively one and the same thing in the city of Belfast. You talk about unionist leaders, do you mean leaders of mainstream yes. unionist parties? Yes. Not minor figures on the periphery? No. No. Not minor figures on the periphery. And I take that very seriously indeed. Yeah, yes, I mean, you, you could challenge me on the basis that I made my own assessment. And I'm well capable of make, making my own assessment mm. through the work that I do. But that assessment that I have made has been confirmed by conversations that I've had about who people believe, i.e. on the unionist political leadership side, believe are involved in these attacks in Belfast. So just to be clear, you're telling me that these are figures from within the DUP and the Ulster Unionist Party? Mainstream unionist elected representatives have told me that they accept my analysis that in the city of Belfast, the UVF, the PUP and the Orange Order are one and the same thing. And what do and they propose to do about need, that? Well, I believe it needs to be challenged, just as I have challenged those so-called Republican dissidents who would try to drag us back to the past. OK, let's come back to Haas. Deputy First Minister, you see this process clearly now as one of implementation, but you can't implement something that hasn't been agreed and unionists haven't agreed. So where do we go from here? Well, we need to get agreement, and that's what I'm trying to do. I think it's hugely important that we recognise that politics is the art of the possible, and to make the possible a reality, compromise is a central field. Steve, if you look at the three areas that we were talking about, the whole issue of the past, parades, and flag symbols and emblems, let's take them one by one. On the issue of the past, the Sinn Féin position was that we wanted to see an international independent truth commission established. We didn't get that. We got, some, we got something that we could live with. So what did we do? We compromised. Mm. On the issue of parades, the Orange Order's demand was they wanted to see the end of the present Parades Commission. I argued for parading powers to be devolved to our administration in order to try and facilitate the difficulties that they were facing. I compromised. On the issue of flags, symbols and emblems, uh, we wanted the issue of Maze Long Cash, our national flag, the Irish tricolour, in the discussions what was happening to the Union flag and how it was being abused all over the place. 
dealt with. And we didn't manage to deal with that. But what we did manage to do was establish a commission, which, if there is a mature debate, can allow us to have a very sensible discussion about Irishness and about Britishness and about how we should respect each other. So you had a meeting on Tuesday of this week. You've got another meeting between the five party leaders next week. Is that the way to deal with this process? Is Sinn Féin committed to moving forward on that basis for however long it takes? Sinn Féin is totally and absolutely committed to finding a solution. But what I am not going to do is allow the establishment of a working party down from Peter Robinson, other party leaders and myself, which will repeat the failure of two to three years. So it has to be party leaders? I have insisted that this, if it is to be taken forward and the exploration of a solution found, has to be done by ourselves. And have they agreed with you on that? Well, we are all going to meet again next Tuesday. That is the only way to take this forward. It may not be successful, but I am absolutely dedicated and committed to finding a way forward because, to be quite honest, I am fed up, fed up hearing that the public out there who deserve better are disgusted with their politicians who believe we can't agree on anything. Even though a lot of good work has been done outside of these contentious issues in terms of you know, fishing up to unemployment, mm. bringing in foreign direct investment, trying to ensure that people get the services that they, des they deserve. But all the time, you know, whenever the North has talked about it, it's talked about in the context of conflict and violence on the streets. We have a duty as politicians to end that. And this is the best opportunity. The Haas document okay. is the best opportunity we will ever have. The Secretary of State, Theresa Villers, um, spoke to me on Sunday Politics last week. She said she's ready to step in and chair discussions if she's asked by the First Minister and yourself to do that. Is that an option you're looking at? Would that help? No, that, that's not an option and it's not one that uh, I would favour. Well, why not? Because we're, we are the political leaders. We've been through the Haas process. Uh, and I want to put on the, the public record my deep appreciation of the contribution made by Richard Haas and Megan O'Sullivan. They spent six months dealing with these issues. They are very experienced uh, diplomats. They are people who knew the ins and outs of the situation here. And I think that we should record our thanks and appreciation for what they've done. That is finished now. What I would like to see is we as party leaders finally cracking this ourselves. And for example, if we do crack it ourselves, I can ring Richard Haas, Peter can ring Richard Haas and say, come back for a ceremonial handover of the document that he produced. Well, if you saw his reaction when I asked him last Thursday night on The View if he might come back, where he uh, laughed in a pretty enthusiastic way, it was no, pretty I clear, I think, that I don't he has him. no intention of coming back. Yeah, and I have no intention of asking him to come back short of us telling him that we've reached agreement and we wish him to come back because of the mighty work that he did in producing the paper that he, that he produced. Would he come back in those okay. circumstances? Uh, I don't have any doubt and about what, it. What is the deadline, uh, Martin McGuinness, that you are looking at for getting this resolved? Well, I, what I, is the time scale? I'll, I'll tell you what I think the Americans' deadline is. This needs to be done before St. Patrick's Day. 17th of March. As far as they're concerned, you know, every year we're invited to uh, the White House to meet with uh, uh, the President. Uh, they've taken a huge interest, a lot of foreign direct investment that comes into the north and we've been you know, hugely successful over the course of the last two or three years. I, I think if politicians have any sense of themselves, if politicians have any respect for themselves, if politicians have any respect for our community, we will do this, crack this in the course of the coming days and weeks, not months. We will leave it there, Martin McGuinness. Thanks very much indeed for joining us. Thank you, Mark.